All right. Oh. Uh, we're going to get started in a second here. And uh, what I request from you is to think up your hardest questions about grading, your absolute hardest questions, because we've got a panel that can handle it. I am going to try to be quiet. <laughs> Impossible. Impossible, I know. All right, uh, welcome to our session. And let me tell you a little bit of background on why we're here right now. All right, the little bit of background on why we're here right now is because uh, the Senate um, had some information about how we as faculty should assign grades. And we as faculty think we should assign grades. It is all about me. Well, it's not really, but uh, there are constraints on what we can do and we should talk to our colleagues and all that kind of fun stuff. But rather than have an open breakout discussion of the two fine, the presentation and the fine panel discussion that we had, uh, that was the original plan. But Patrick and Jane came up with the idea of, hey, you guys have been talking about grades as a Senate. This is going to be the set of people that have to assign grades for the rest of their lives. Why don't we have a conversation? And so that's where this started. So I, I would like to start this presentation out with giving an A to Patrick and giving an A to Jane. And you can see there that their appreciation A's are there in front of them. Thank you, please. And thank you. Thank you. Did you get a Looks like he's getting one for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. This is a job well done, right? And thank you. Isn't this fun? Did and you? thank you. Yeah. Now, they have all A's. We can go home for the semester. This is probably not the way to think about grades. The way you should think about student performance, evaluation, all of that is inside your heads. It's by your students. And these panelists are here to help. Luke? I knew he'd do that. <laughs> first thing I said this morning, good morning, is I told him, Jim, I don't want to go first. Well, OK. Uh, you've all seen the question, uh, the position of what this session is about. Um, I have an answer to the session title, and the answer would be yes and yes. Uh, what do I mean by that? Those of you that don't know me, I'm chair of the Department of Management for the second time. That means I'm probably the least smart person in the room. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and here's what I mean by this. I've been teaching for since 2010 freshmen. In the College of Business, it's the only freshman class. And because I'm back in a chair's job, I have to give it up. There's some good to that, and there's also some bad to that, giving it up. But you get a new, uh, those of you that teach freshmen uh, in the B school, we don't know what that's like. We, we don't do it, except now we have for the last five years. And in the fall, it's a large class, three to 400. And in the spring, it's a small one. And what I mean by yes and yes is this. Over the years, especially the last 23 years, those of us that have been chairs and on the pack forever if you're not a chair we've read all the student evaluations of all of our faculty and the departments and essentially what we start reading is about are we're looking for respect from the students right um, you weed out the i love her and i hate him then you get everything in between right and you look at this, the level of respect and then in our department we also look at all the grades that are given that year by that faculty member along with the student evaluations and we publish that for all the faculty in the department to see. And what funny thing happens is, is that the person, the real educators in the department that wind up with 
high standards in grades also seemingly get high marks from the students. Uh, in spite of what we might believe, that generally is what happens with our best educators. And we start talking to them, and if you ask them this question, I'm sure most of them would say yes and yes. The students learn when they put something into it, and they put something into it when you hold them accountable and are fair and do all those things that you should do as a good educator. So it's hard for me to answer yes on one side and no on the other. Uh, student learning is a core value for us and I'm sure for everybody in the room. It's about student learning. How do you generate student learning? How do you get that done is what we're all doing in our careers as best we can. Some of us seem to be doing it better than others, and those are the people we go talk to and find out what it is that you're doing. You know, what are you doing that apparently I'm not? And uh, so, do you have something to do with the grades? Uh, how could you not have, and have something to do with the grades? You design the class, you set up the accountability triggers on deadlines and the assignments and the exams and you have a great deal to do with that but then you also design opportunities for the students to learn and then you cross your fingers just like you did with your own kids and hope they do it you hold them accountable but sometimes they don't um, reminded of a story in the very first class I did with the freshman uh, I was standing, by the way, with some parents at a, an award ceremony is how I got drafted into the freshman class because a couple of university people came up and asked me right in front of the parents, would you stand up a freshman Discovery Corps course for freshmen in the College of Business? Well, what am I going to say? You know, well, of course I will. In that first class, I went home that first month and a half with my tail between my legs. And my wife is, a, is a, an elementary school principal. And she said, what is the matter with you? You've been moping for a month. I said, you know all those teaching awards that I have over the years? I'm giving them back. I don't think I'm any good at this. And she says, well, you have the digital natives. And she gave me a book to read about the digital natives. And I did, and I said, oh. I'm supposed to be the parent and hold them accountable and do all that kind of stuff, huh? She said, yeah, you are. Funny thing happened when you do that with a freshman are, you know, they're busy staying up all night because they can right now. <laughs> but you, you, you wind up feeling a little bit like the phys ed instructor at field day in high school. But once you get past all that, about midway through the semester, they realize that they really are accountable. They're accountable for attendance and all the various other things that you're doing. And they start to learn. So did I have something to do with that? By virtue of designing the course and maintaining the accountability for the students, yes. I had something to do with that, and I'd be crazy to say that I didn't. Was it about me? That's the hard part of this session's name. Is it about me? It's about them learning and whatever role I played to help them do that. And in some cases, uh, I've been rewarded well by watching students, freshmen, succeed in retaining them and not losing them. That's been rewarding. That part, I kind of hate to give up. The field day director, I'm glad to give that part up. So, uh, in a nutshell, uh, there is no way that you can be a, an instructor and an educator. Most, those folks in this room, well, there hard, probably isn't anybody in this room my age, but when we were kids and when we went to college, it would be not unusual for the professor to say, well, if you want to learn something, that's up to you. I teach. I remember being told that more than once. That's not good enough in 2015. As a, as a skilled educator, your job is to design the course, set it up so the students have the greatest opportunity to learn. 
true. You can't read the books for them. You can't do the work for them. But you can design the course with triggers of, of either motivators or accountability triggers, whatever you wish to call it, that do work if you experiment with it. So yes, you have something to do with it, but it's about them. They, they, they each have a very short position statement. That was it. We're yes all professors and yes. too. I'm Brenda McCoy and I'm a chair of a Department of Community and Professional Programs, which is really sort of irrelevant to how I arrived on this panel. I got here because for the last couple of years I have been serving on the University uh, Committee on Retention. And, and we've been doing a lot of uh, gathering of data and analyzing that data and I've been very privileged to uh, work with some really smart folks on that committee and so I I thought I might share a little bit of what we've learned because uh, some of the really interesting things when you're looking at grade distribution you're really balancing these two R's one is rigor and the other is retention and this is a tricky balance and all of you know what I'm saying so we've actually got five long semesters worth of data that we've looked at and so just really quickly in your head based on what you know from your own experiences in the classroom with students Tell me what you think in terms of grade distribution. Where do we award the most grades to freshmen and sophomores? Freshmen and sophomores, A, B, C, D, or F? Answer that question. All students for the last five semesters taking freshman, sophomore level classes, where did we give the most grades? The answer is, and you would be wrong, the answer is A. We gave and it's very, very stable. Over the last five semesters, the largest category of grades have gone to A's at 34%. At 34%. Between A's and B's, that number is also stable at 62. Why I tell you this is it's not just about I, it's about we. And what I mean by that is if 62% of the students taking freshman and sophomore level courses at this institution are making A's and B's, they form ideas about their skill sets. And not only one or two of them form ideas, a big old pack of them form ideas about how good they are. So I'm looking at some of your faces and I look at my faculty members back there and my Leslie that I was commiserating with yesterday. And, and by the time they reach junior, senior level courses, they have ideas about what they deserve, how entitled they feel to certain grades. I'm an A student, they tell me. You are doing something wrong because clearly I've got this and clearly you're stupid. And, and honestly, I've been feeling pretty stupid recently. So I, I joined Lou in this and, and my, hair, my hair color budget is not big enough anymore for some of the problems that I have on this front. So just so you have that, the, the, the category of C's is also very, very, very stable at about 17%. The smallest category grades we give at the freshman sophomore level are D's. So now that you feel like maybe you've used real live data analytics to take a look in the mirror for UNT Global at the freshman sophomore level, this isn't my college, this isn't my department, this is we, this is us, this is, this is what we are doing together across disciplines. Then let me tell you a little bit about our DFWI track record. So that, for those of you that don't throw these, thinks around a lot, that's the percent of students that earn either a D, an F, withdraw either WF or W, or go incomplete. And so that's relatively stable at 20% also across the last five semesters. And so ask yourself what you think that means in light of the next statistic that I'll give you, and that is the top quartile of the courses that we teach. We teach about 400 courses a semester produce 60 to 67 percent of all the D's, F's, W's, and I's that we, we actually have students earn. Half of the courses we teach generate 90 percent of the D's, F's, W's, and I's. Half of the courses we teach produce those. So we have a two-headed monster. You know, on the one hand, we've got some rigor issues that we might want to take a look at. Now, does that mean that you do, or you do, or you do? Well, I don't know. In my department, we look at performance in courses semester by semester at a granular level, section by section, course by course. And we do that as a point of awareness. 
Lou and I have many lunch discussions on this because management does the same thing. We also look at DFWI rates, and over the last several years, we've steadily driven those down in my department just by, you know, keep, it's like getting on a scale. Mm. You know, you, you look at these numbers and you become aware of it, but I would say to you, from a data analytics standpoint, we need to get smarter. We need to really start relying on the data. We need to look at courses where DFWI rates are very, very, very high. And while it's very difficult to agree on what that is, what is a high DFWI percentage, I think that we can agree on what it shouldn't be, and it shouldn't be over 40%. So think about that with me for a second. If you had a 40 to 50% chance every time you got on an airplane of having it crash, tell me how many times you'd fly. So if our students, every time they sign up for a course and they pay $1,200 in tuition and fees before they've bought the textbooks, have a 50% chance of not finishing that course because they've made a DNF or they withdrew, how satisfied should we be if that persists semester after semester? So here's my little end of my dialogue to say that I really would appeal to all of you. It's about me, but it's about us. It's about me looking at my performance in the classroom. It's about me looking at my students individually, trying to figure out what they need, and if we're getting it there, what our learning outcome should be. But it's got to be about us. And we've got to start a dialogue about failure rates and success rates. We've got to start a dialogue about rigor. And we are way behind the eight ball on this. We needed to be started yesterday and last year. You know, and, and look at the number of people in this room, and the thing speaks for itself. Interesting. I think uh, as a result, I'm going to change a little bit of what I plan to say. Um, first, I'll just give you a little bit of background about myself. I teach in the College of Music, and I've been an operatic performer for about 42 years. This year, I was a Grammy nominee in the Best Opera Recording category, so that's exciting. <laughs> And I have over 40 commercial CDs. Uh, most of them are still in print plus two films. I've taught at three universities. Uh, and they are, it's an interesting trajectory, I'm sure you would find, because I've gone from Stanford University, which is a um, uh, Ivy League, to University of Kentucky, which is a land grant, to UNT, which you would describe as regional. However, the music programs have grown in size and prestige uh, at, each, at each institution. At Stanford, I had a rather entrepreneurial kind of experience. It was in the middle of all the dot-coming and dot-bombing and the environment of you know, creating the work and, cre and creating the learning and all that was very prevalent and very exciting. Um, here at UNT, I teach one-on-one -on -one classes and sm small classes, one-on-one -on -one lessons and small classes, anywhere from two to 15 around there. Um, in the past, I've taught larger classes where I produced and directed opera, created and directed an early music ensemble, early music being, in classical music being music before 1750, 1800, something like that. Almost all of my students throughout all of this have been uh, advanced, hardworking students, not all, but most. And my studio includes freshman through doctoral students, vocal performance majors and concentrations. That's music ed. I have very few concentrations right now, only one. The rest are vocal performance majors. Um, in reference to uh, what I've heard so far, I just wanted to mention that I myself got an F as an undergraduate. That, of course, was in the 70s when such things could happen and when school was cheap. So you could, you know, just move on and do it again or something like that. And it was in one of the gatekeeper courses, right? So I managed to, you know, survive that and go on to accomplish all of this. Um, some, I just wanted to let you know that some faculty in the College of Music, I have to take a kind of microcosm approach because I'm not looking at big data like deans and chairs are on a regular basis, so I'm going from my experience outward. But I do know that some faculty in the College of Music teach courses for up to 400 to 600 students in size, and the sizes of the classes range all over the map. In performance alone, we have chamber ensembles to orchestras, symphonic bands, etc. cetera. Um, the music majors, even the freshmen, generally come to us a lot of them anyway, come to us having already dedicated their lives to music, being this being UNT in a well-known program, and they have to audition and compete to get in um, quite heavily. And they are, a lot of them, I would say most of them, are more worried about getting Bs than Cs in their uh, major, at least. Uh, we do have some gatekeeper type courses as exist in all fields, and I think my thoughts on this during the EC is what ended up me being invited to this, because we were looking at these, you know, faculty, faculty versus DFWI rates, 
and some faculty who have the hard chore of teaching the courses that students must excel in will have more of those kinds of grades, I think. No, I can't be sure because I'm not looking at the statistics. But I do know from anecdotal uh, conversations that they see more of the drops, withdrawals, and so on. Music theory and musicianship is this for music. A musician absolutely must be able to hear on a complex and highly advanced level um, pr rather quickly rhythm, pitch, harmony, and structure. It's uh, uh, being able to analyze as we do analyze paper, analyze something complex in writing, they have to do this through the organ of the ear. Um, and our students uh, usually progress, most of them progress fairly rapidly in such courses, and they must complete them before they can take their upper divisional exams. So they're all kind of scared of that. They take it generally at the end of their fourth semester of major study. Sometimes if they transfer, that's a little bit later, something like that. And uh, we work, uh, it's, that's, it's at that point that some of them will not do well, and we, they will have to change their major if they fail it twice. Um, we try to sometimes encourage them to change to the BA in music or help facilitate them into a change of major. We're all looking right now at the 2.0 versus 2.75 and all of that in terms of being able to graduate and what do we do with people who can't keep, make the grade in the major, what will we walk for them at UNT. But we do work to, in particular in the College of Music, to keep their love of music undamaged. Um, and I, I would say that we are doing better on that, just from the gut feeling compared to 2007 when I first came. Um, Short-term incompletes in music are quite common. And the reason for that is because even relatively minor illnesses like colds or injuries like a strain um, are quite serious for musicians and must be accommodated for their long-term health and musical success. Our highly competitive undergraduate students sometimes find this requires an attitude adjustment, particularly freshmen, sophomores, who in high school have been go, 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 and, wind, and get to UNT and find out that go, go, go will get you hurt, hurt, hurt. <laughs> and uh, so these are usually made up. These incompletes are usually pretty short term. Um, they're usually made up within months, say, and they happen in December quite frequently for singers in particular because of the weather. And then they'll be usually made up in early January. Uh, some of these happen in the spring fewer thanks to the weather. Um, and occasionally, I even had a recent uh, incident where this student, you know, we get occasionally students who are financially strapped and they, you know, this particular student is elsewhere at the moment dealing with his family and was sick during the juries and so, you know, I write to him from time to time to try to help him get that finished within a year because there's no reason he can't at least whatever he's doing have his grade in his course. And students may with drop or withdraw from courses, by the way, in music for any number of reasons, including some specific to music. For example, uh, vocal students, if they are cast in the opera, uh, they may quickly realize that it would behoove them to drop a core course and take it at a less busy time. Uh, vocal students are also required to be proficient in Italian, French, and German pronunciation, so they quickly realize that they should prioritize these courses over the core courses that their fellow freshmen and sophomores are taking early on. This can happen, not always, but it does. These guys tend to take them in the summer to try to make up for that. And finally, our graduate students are outstanding. Many come to us already active as young professional performers. And although today we're focusing primarily on undergraduates, it's important to note that at least among our teachers in the College of Music, quite a few are graduate teaching fellows. In addition to their other stellar credentials, a number of these come to us with quite strong teaching backgrounds. They teach the music secondary students, for example, if you're majoring in clarinet and you secondary in piano, so on. They teach them. And also many of the concentration students, which are the music ed students, and these graduate students are mentored by the faculty and mentored into teaching and also we are then drawn into helping them mentor their students as well as our own as need arises. That's it. So my name is uh, Jim Mirnick. I'm from the Department of Political Science and um, I too like Brenda and Robbie are uh, very much interested in the DFWI rates. Uh, in political science, we teach two core courses that every student in Texas has to take. There's political science 1040 and political science 1050. We have small sections that may be 20 to 30 students. Um, most of them now are above 300, 500. I'll be teaching a course this fall that's capped at about 1,000. And so we've got a wide range of student populations. Everybody's got to take these courses, so it's a, it's a it's a great kind of um, environment in which to learn about why some classes may be better um, or have better uh, DFW rates than others. And so with a colleague of mine, uh, Victor Pributak in the College of Business, 
we set out to study these courses and we had a, a research assistant go through every syllabus for our 1040 and 1050 classes and code every single thing that was done in these courses, whether it was extra credit, papers, attendance taken, clickers, uh, how much office hours there were, just every single piece of information we could get about these classes to see which classes were more successful than the others, which ones had the lower DFWI rates. And I expected that, you know, we'd see things like, you know, class size would matter, that more engagement with the students would matter, just in general, more, um, more opportunities for interaction with the student would matter. And so we, we gathered up all these data uh, for about 24 uh, different classes over two semesters, and we crunched the numbers, and we found that virtually nothing predicted DFWI rates. Couldn't find anything that really seemed to matter. Um, and so, you know, we, we did the study, and at the end of the day, you know, I just, I kind of felt bad. I went back to Mike Simmons, who I was kind of working with this on, and said, I can't seem to find anything that's going on here. Um, if from the perspective of what the faculty are doing, none of this really seems to be making a difference. And I was particularly struck by uh, four faculty who are some of our best teachers in the department. Uh, they've all won major university awards. They were all teaching classes basically the same size, all well loved by the students. Two of them had what we would probably consider to be kind of high DFW rates. The other two, pretty low, lowest in the department DFW rates. Thought, What's going on there? What, maybe there's something I can learn by going and talking to them and saying, you know, what are you doing in this class? Why do you think your rate is up here and somebody else's is down here? And I went and talked to all four of them, and they didn't have a clue. There wasn't anything that they could pinpoint, and so I was kind of left with sort of a cheap sort of, uh, statistical kind of explanations. Well, we don't have enough sort of variation. You know, perhaps it's a whole constellation of factors. Perhaps there are a variety of things that these people do, and it's not any one thing, but it's a whole lot of things together. Um, and then I went and looked at the student evaluations, thinking, you know, maybe a lot of it's about, you know, whether the students like you. That had nothing to do with it either. And so at the end of the day, I had to conclude that this is a, it's a, trying to understand these DFW rates is, is fairly complex. Certainly approaching it from the perspective of the classes and the faculty, just that, that one angle isn't going to work. But we need to know a lot more about who these students were, not only academically, but also kind of socially, psychologically. We needed a whole lot more data on these students to try to understand why it is that some are dropping out of these classes than others. And so, you know, I have to kind of end my little bit here with uh, kind of a plea for a lot more data. I saw what Jason uh, Simon was talking about earlier. There, it looks like there'll be some great data in there. I think we, we need to do kind of um, overtime panel surveys of students to try to really kind of sort this out because uh, frankly, if somebody comes to me and says, you know, what can I do? What are some, some things that I can do you know, maybe not too easy, but you know, it's some, uh, you know, without a whole lot of work to try to improve my DFW rate, and you know, I'd have to say, you know, I'm not really sure. Um, you can do a whole lot of things, like I think, you know, Robbie was showing earlier, that can really have an impact. Um, but you know, short of doing, you know, a very kind of major course overhaul, I'm not really sure. So uh, I don't usually like to conclude my remarks by saying, I don't know, <laughs> but that's kind of the upshot. So. Uh, I would love it if others would collect some more data on this. <laughs> Thanks. Well, that concludes our part of this. Uh, what we need in order for this to be a success is for you to ask your questions. So you've thought about this. Obviously, you're going to think about it into the future. And then as the extra questions come along, there is a Twitter, is that correct? The uh, feed that has been set up for this to continue uh, discussions if they occur to you afterward. If, if, the, if the, anything sparks an idea for Jim or for Jennifer or for Brenda or for Lou, uh, if it comes to me, I'll send it to them. Uh, we, we, can, we can go forward from here. All right, so with that prelim, do we have any folks that are willing to be brave and ask their question right now? Mike. You have over 600 teaching fellows at the university. How do they fit into this conversation about grade? Yeah. 
Well, I think that teaching fellows and adjunct faculty are very important because we've got a large number of courses taught across the enterprise by uh, contingent faculty members, and I think it grows ever more important to pull them in tight and hold them close with us and, and help them understand that they're a vital part of the team, including giving them feedback on what DFWI rates look like in their classes over a period of time, what their course rigor levels look like, and talk to them about uh, establishing um, uh, learning outcomes and deciding what skill sets our students need to learn. I know that program coordinators in our department do that. They work directly with adjuncts and then in, in larger departments where there are a large number of teaching fellows, um, I think that's important as well. To go along with that, uh, in fact, one of our adjuncts is sitting right to my left right here, Dr. Denise Philpot, who teaches not only for us, but she teaches for Brenda in Czech, and she would tell you that that report that I told you about that I'll, we've been doing now since 1993, all the teaching fellows are listed in there because they're teaching. So all of that, go, all that information and data comes, is collected, put together, sent back to everyone teaching in our department. I mean, we obviously don't walk around and put it up on the walls in the college business, but anyone is free to see it if they wish. So, so teaching fellows, we feel like, uh, teaching fellows and adjuncts, and, and uh, they're, they're teaching just like we are, so should be, should be with us the same. They're, in the case of teaching fellows, we refer to them as colleagues in training, mm -hmm. but they're still colleagues, they're teaching. Um, Jim, I got some data for you. Um, at a previous university, the dean and I did the big study in the sky on what, what we could come up with that uh, was a significant predictor of student evaluations, and we found one. Time of day. <laughs> that was it. In a teaching evaluation study that we did for the College of Business to create a new instrument, uh, we, we had to learn a foreign field to us, and that's the characteristics of top teachers and things like that. And uh, we found this great study. It said there are 21 characteristics of top teachers. It's a old, fairly old study. And I said, yes, finally, I'm going to learn the answer. And it turns out any one teacher has one, maybe two of those. <laughs> the rest of it is your style. And so we realized that we needed to go back somewhere else and start looking for some of the other things besides just teaching evaluations. Um, about the College of Music TFs, uh, at least in my department, they are part of the grading process. We, we, we view them and talk about them as they're so talented that they are going to be the star teachers um, and star performers in the future so that, for example, as I mentioned, that they take the secondaries and many of, if even most of the concentrations. And there's an ongoing discussion with the music ed department about how that sometimes raises difficulties for them against other schools in recruitment. Um, but they, these students that study with these TFs, we're gonna be long gone and forgotten when those guys are really in the middle of their career and these students are gonna be able to say, I study at UNT with that teacher. And then also they grade uh, their own students and they tend to grade high, so you have to kind of, you know. But um, they also comment very, very uh, encouragingly on each other's students. They don't grade our students, but they're able to submit grades for their students and then the faculty uh, uh, grade, and they are able to submit comments for the faculty students. And um, so their grades and their comments are factored into the students that they hear. They hear um, all of, the, of each other's students and so on, so they get practice with the jury grading. And um, then I wanted to tell a joke that, remind, that Jim's um, comment reminded me of. In this, anybody remember the Soviet Union? <laughs> the Soviet Union, remember that? In 1985, I was in Vienna and taking a German course, and it, Vienna was a neutral country, and all these students from all over the countries that we couldn't visit and couldn't visit us were there. And one of them was a 16-year-old Russian prodigy, and he told a joke about um, that there was a, in the Soviet Union, there were all these people running over to one tobacco company. They were buying all the cigarettes from this one tobacco company, and that's not supposed to happen in a state-regulated uh, system, where everything's supposed to be the same. So they asked each of these tobacco companies, what are you putting in your cigarettes? The answers were invariably 
three parts old newspapers, 20 parts goat hair, you know, um, saw, uh, sawdust, you know, rug shavings, you know, this kind of thing. And finally, they got to the one that was so popular, made the same list, goat hair, shavings, et cetera, newspaper, and mm, two parts tobacco. Oh, you're putting tobacco. So <laughs> it can take very little of the real deal to get students really excited. Very, very little. <laughs> uh, 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 that's good. Jim, I think it's you. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to follow up that one. Um, but uh, I, would, you know, I would encourage all teaching fellows, all students that want to be teaching fellows, all faculty to encourage their graduate students to uh, sign up for the G-STEP program over in CLEAR, which is a wonderful place to get uh, a lot of training, learning how to teach and grade and things like that. I wish that had been something we had when I was in graduate school. So let's put in a plug for that program. Yeah. Good plug. You can't. Pretty close. Uh, I would say it's a little, a little bit softer that A's and B's happen in this. I'm talking about undergraduates, and that's fine in the major. Not very often. Mostly, um, mostly they do probably get A's. Not always. You know, not every semester, and, and not always. The um, the barrier exam, the upper divisional exam, is important. They have two chances to take it. They can still get an A in their jury and not pass, or an A for the semester, shall I say. They, if they do excellent work in their studio, but they don't do the best possible jury or there are problems that indicate that getting further along will get in the way, they can, they can be prepared and not sing well or play well, even though they're prepared. Uh, they maybe have some sorts of uh, physical ailments or so or habits or injury that's holding them back. And um, unfortunately, that's a real consideration in the real world of music. You can't just be prepared and succeed. You have to sound good. And so um, what we do in a situation like that is give them a second try, you know, get them to the, if, it's, if, we, if we detect, we can't diagnose, but we can detect. So we get them to someone who can and try and get that worked out if that's the case. If it's something else, we try to help them with that. But generally, they can make a good grade A or B and still not pass their upper divisional because we don't hear them as having progressed. You know, they're, they're, that what's happening is potentially not going to move towards the proficiency exam or towards their uh, hearing for their senior recital in a couple of years. So, but usually on the second try, they do. Um, this is undergrads, and their grades might range all, all over the map. They might get a C or something in their, in their like, as I said, the gatekeeper courses, but they have still passed, um, and they might do much better in their performance courses. The graduate students, doctoral students, can't get lower than a B. Master's students can't get lower than a C. We're kind of wrestling with this at the moment, too, as to whether a doctoral student can have one C in an, in outside of their major or so. We'll see where that goes. <laughs> Gracias. 
If you, have. if you don't mind me plunging in there, since I'm the one who mentioned getting one, um, <laughs> I, I retook the course, and that's a much you know there's so much there's so much more baggage on that now that school is more expensive, you know I retook it and you know whatever was in the way I got it out of the way and I passed it and probably even did well, and then you know uh, it's many many years later and the that course <coughs> for one thing singers are well known to be generally behind on all that musicianship because we come to, the, come to music later than the instrumentalists often. It's better for us if we have instrumental background because then we are faster and can fit in with the instrumentalists and all of that. They are kind of, uh, we're in our 20s when they, similar to them when they're 10 to 12 in terms of proficiency. So there's, uh, that's kind of a known quantity in, in music and even sometimes the courses are divided up to you know, mostly singers and mostly instrumentalists and singers figure out which, which section to take. I, and I and so that, that's part of it. But I, I think that uh, students, you know, if possible, get it together and retake it. I, I think uh, Dr. Taylor wants to weigh in on this because this is one of those really important conversations and this, that we hear a lot. Yes, we do. And it, it does demonstrate such contrast between majors and colleges. Let me... Uh, let me give you something that most of my colleagues aren't aware of that is going on that I have, I always talked to, well, ever since I learned about it last spring, I talked to my freshmen about it, and that is this. There are over 200 colleges of business in the U.S. alone that have adopted exit exams. And those exit exams are similar to SATs, ACTs, and so forth, geared toward the types of skills that our employers that hire our graduates want. And the reason that has happened is because many of our employers don't believe us anymore. And they don't believe us because of great inflation. Yeah. And not necessarily great inflation in North Texas, because what you see when you read these reports and things, that they, they go to the big schools like Stanford and Harvard and whatever, and they say, you know, everybody gets an A. And uh, ultimately, because of that, they have said, we wind up interviewing and then hiring and then realizing they don't have the types of things we'd like them to have. So there's a whole movement that's been created now that it's, it's not something that, uh, that is mandated by any state government. It is adopted by colleges who want the employers to keep coming to their schools and interview their students. Exit exams. Now, every time I mention that to students, it's interesting what I get. From the freshmen, oh, sure, that's a good idea. But when you get to seniors, what? <laughs> I, I need to get out of here, right? So in answering your question, it's, it's coming to us by the people that hire our graduates in the colleges of business. So when you hear that statistic and think about it, we're not going to be immune to that. It's, it's going to reach us at some point. I, I, Yolanda, I think you make a really, it's an excellent question, and I think Lou is right. We can think of ourselves as a place where we educate students, which, which is one of the joys that I have doing this, or we could consider ourselves a, a credentialing institution. <laughs> so we're certifying that someone has uh, some sort of skill set. And I think Lou's point is bang on because employers are increasing, increasingly telling us we're not getting it there. Mm -hmm. And as we frequently have this discussion in my department, the grades that are going out simply don't match the skill sets that we see when we are grading. As I so well know when I'll sit down this afternoon to grade essay questions on my last exam and I look at the reading and writing skills and you know, when, when students at the junior level don't know how to calculate percentages, now, I don't consider that hard math. D does that make sense? That's not, 
that's not tough stuff. And so I, I think that maybe at some point grades will become irrelevant because we're making them irrelevant and that because some other point, stuff yeah. that, that's there. And, and we may move to a badge system or employers may have their own way of determining whether someone has the skill set that has nothing to do with a credential that we hand them called a bachelor's degree. And that would be a very sad day for us because that would signal that we really haven't been adaptable as an enterprise. To, to go along with that, the, the, this movement is so new on the exit exams and colleges of business, we don't know yet if they're teaching to the test, okay? But some employers probably want us to teach to the test because it's basic things like communication, teamwork, and so forth. Um, when you ask, uh, when you ask uh, students, I had a senior who in one of, my, one of the harder classes that I teach came into my office and said, I just can't believe you're making us write this. I said, why? Well, I've never had to write a paper. I said, what? He said, I've never had to write a paper. And he was able to hide through team projects, and he had not written a paper by himself, a, a big term paper. And so he was scared to death. So I had to sit down and work with him and, hey, uh, here's what it looks like, what you need to produce. And, uh, and that's not that, well, that was, a, that was a startling story that day for me, and it was recent. On the other hand, it, when you go along that with exit exams and credentialing and, and so forth, who knows where we're headed, but it is us. We're the ones that create this. We're the ones that manage it. We design it. We, we, we do it. And so if we don't fix it, they're gonna, someone's going to fix it for us. Yeah. Jim just turned to me when the word exit exam came up and said, that's what you, will, you have in the College of Music, which we do. And I think I would call that uncoupling yeah. mm -hmm uncoupling grading and learning from ca capability, right. right? Because capability in, in performance is delivering on the day. Learning is a whole different matter. You can do a fantastic series of rehearsals and then you know, be a little under the weather when you get up on stage and the reviewers are out in the audience and you'll get a little bit of a trashing. And it's not very fun. You still get paid, you still did your duty, you still did the teamwork, you still were a trooper. But unfortunately, your best performance was the second one when the review, re, reviewer wasn't there. So it's, you, know, you, have to please, you have to please the process and you have to please the outcome. And they're two different things. And uh, uh, I also heard from a Stanford colleague about a student who had written upon receiving 97.5 grade, why she wasn't receiving, or he wasn't, I can't remember which, was receive, wasn't receiving an A+. Plus. And so that sparked a whole discussion of why the 97.5 wasn't an A+. Plus. And I remember from my Stanford days that I would get occasional messages of complaint about A- minuses because we had the minus and plus system. And uh, that's a whole other can of worms. But I do really believe that we can, we can focus our efforts both on teaching and learning in the classroom and outcome, you know, step-by-step -step, uh, moments. Also uncouple teaching from learning as well. To a certain degree, Jim, you're okay. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. All right. Uh, there was a yeah, uh, it's it was mentioned that uh, of course we do want to do teaching and learning, but we have to look at the audience. Uh, I don't know about the statistics at UNT in general, but I, in my class, I find that most of my students are working outside the university more hours than I would see possible to carry a, even a half load. And I don't see how much more they can do. Uh, it was mentioned too that the students learn what they put into the course. If they don't have hours to put themselves into the homework, into the reading, how can they learn? Right. Well, I work through college. Did anybody else in here work, work while they're in school? It's a never-ending problem, isn't it? Trying to manage, your, I do know this, my grades went up when I worked because I managed my time better. I'm not saying that's an answer, I'm just, it's, uh, I don't have an answer for that one, to be honest with you.
I think, though, that that speaks to the need for data analytics, because I had a student I visited with earlier this week who wanted to finish up the summer, which involved taking 21 hours of online courses in the summer session. And so I called her and spoke to her, and I said, you spell that suicide. I mean, that's a really tough thing to do, and I'm looking at the, the composition of courses and saying, you know, these are, these are tough courses that require a significant amount of reading and, and, and effort outside the classroom. And I think that if I, I'm seeing that like you more often, and the question begs itself, how can they do that? And the answer is, if there are enough of them are successful, then there has to be something else at play. And, and I think we have to be tough on ourselves and look for that kind of thing and ask, should it really be possible for a student uh, to do that sort of thing? And if they're coming out of it, what are we really asking them to do? I mean, how much rigor really does exist in those places? And, and I, I think that means we have to be reflective and we have to look at ourselves and, as instructors. And, it, you know, we get worn down. I mean, we get binged on every semester by stuff. And so, you know, I'm an A student, I'm an A student, and maybe you can start singing that song with them. I mean, I don't know. You know I had, you know, the, the freshman class, you hear that all the time. Hey, listen, I was in the Plano Accelerated Program in high school. And yeah, I know, but you're failing my course. You know, you have to come to class. You have to read the book. So I don't know, that's a tough one. This is a tough one. Jim? Yeah, I think there's, our students face a lot of challenges. I think probably many of us didn't have to worry about it. I mean, I, I think some of the issues with paying for school, you know, I, maybe we're not all sort of aware of how much working uh, is draining from their schedule. Because a lot of these kids, and, and adults too, uh, some of the older students are working third shift jobs and they're coming into my eight o'clock in the morning class uh, straight from work. So they've got that issue and I think a lot of them too, even though we, we think that they're a lot more tech savvy than, than a lot of us are, but the fact is a lot of them are coming from school districts where they don't have access to a lot of technology. When they get here, there's not only learning about the college lifestyle and learning about the material, there's also learning about all the technology that goes with it and the learning systems and all these different things. And I think we sometimes kind of overlook that they're, they're facing a lot of challenges that uh, we need to be very much aware of when we're teaching these courses because uh, all it takes is one or two of those things and these students become at risk pretty quickly when they really don't need to be. Uh, you know, I think if we just uh, work a lot more on active engagement um, and these early alerts to try to figure out how we can help them with these problems, we can keep a lot more of them in school. So I was, I was going to address the question of when, when the uh, first question is answered, no. Personally, I, I have had times where I have found myself trapped by my syllabus into giving grades that I wouldn't give in an assessment of the student's learning. Because in just designing the syllabus, I put the points in in a certain way. It's easier to award points on concrete um, didactic kinds of things because they're easy to assess and that's really not where you're trying to go with learning and so I've just in terms of learning how to structure a course so that the mechanisms you use to report the grades actually report the learning is in and of itself a pretty challenging thing mm -hmm. I just thought I'd throw that in. you know that's really that's what those really employers of right. ours and the colleges of business are telling us you know we don't believe your grades we want them to know how to do the following or have an awareness of the following, so that's why they, this moving of exit tests. Yeah, Dan? Correct. Got it. Mm -hmm. The painter Thomas Cole um, came up with the phrase, an artist is a person and a business. And for a singer, this is really very, very vivid. We are the product, we maintain the product, we deliver the product, we, uh, you know, and so on. anything you list that has to do with products and the surrounding activities is done, is, is the being and the action. And that's kind of a, a shocking thing to become aware of when you're a young artist. Um, Thomas Cole's trajectory, for example, was headed down the same path as Vincent van Gogh. In other words, living out an entire lifetime without ever selling a painting. And he then sold a painting 
uh, and describes that as well as this incredible moment when an artist gets what he wants. And then after that became, you know, the guy who sold the most paintings sort of ever. Thomas Cole is the Hudson River School. And we, to this day, we still, you know, it became kind of, kind of copied and, and uh, even uh, an entity or a thing that uh, took on a life of its own and became really quite profitable for him. So, just thinking about that. Question? All right. I, 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 this is just kind of a summary statement, but what I hear is, as I'm listening is that our, our focus needs to maybe change to talking more about learning than about teaching. Uh, first, we need to figure out what this beast is. Um, and it, it has a whole different body of research tied to it. Um, it, it is, it's a paradigm shift for us to look at it. Let's get the neuroscientists in here. Let's get, let's find, I'd like to see more of the DFW um, data upon, you know, exit interviews and that kind of thing. I mean, just really probe what's going on with learning of our students. And when we talk about coming in off a night shift to take a course, we know that scientifically, and, you know, physiologically, that's just not possible. You know, so um, it, it's a different conversation when we change it to learning rather than teaching. Mm -hmm. yeah. That it is. Yep. I agree with that. In case you didn't hear, the question about what was academic advising's role in these conversations, how can they help us get data, or are they playing a role? I think that's a really, really super important question. I, I'm trying to remember what the advising ratio is here at UNT, but uh, for every one advisor, there are about 450 or so students. And, and so that, that realistically makes it tough on them. We've gone to uh, uh, touch point advising for uh, freshmen and sophomores so that we get them through those first couple of years with every semester you go in and see an advisor. But uh, in that period of time these days, there's so much you have to cover with a student from everything from they don't feel like they like their major, they don't know what they're going to do with their career, they're a single mother, they've got something else. And so on top of that, somehow we have to figure out how to work in, gee whiz, you don't seem to perform well in online classes and you keep taking them. And this doesn't work well for you because you don't have the discipline to do an online class when you go two months and then you decide to sign on uh, or mm -hmm. uh, something on that front. So I think that's a real challenge uh, and, and it certainly warrants greater discussion. All of, us have, all of us have advisors in our departments. I have an advisor. Uh, management has about 4,000 students in our classes. That's all the majors in the college. I have one advisor who is excellent. She is fabulous if I can get a student to her. Uh, I bring her to the class as I have her come and see the class so they could meet her. I was at an institution where all the faculty were assigned students at the university. I had a hundred assigned to me. I saw maybe two the whole time and even worse, I was lousy at it because I didn't know all the rules of the university. So advising, advising with people who are experts is absolutely super critical. I, we can't get along without it, yet I don't think we have enough of them. So. Yeah. When I was at Stanford for six years, I was a resident fellow there, and that's uh, equivalent to a housemaster. And I would say that this system of residential education, first of all, the Stanford and Harvard are in ex areas where it's very, very expensive to live. So most of the students, including the graduate students, live on campus. Mm -hmm. So you can get at them. And the other thing is, and so then they're in, within the residential system. And the, inside that system is an amazing amount of nuanced peer mentoring, plus uh, a, a lot of nuanced uh, adult mentoring. Men, uh, faculty would have maybe six mentees that they would maybe have dinner with once a quarter. We would, as a resident fellow, we were overseeing a student staff that had all that nuance that would be directly <laughs> dealing with students' issues 
discuss them weekly. It was, it, th that's the big, big difference, is how much advising goes on and how layered it is and nuanced. Well, uh, one, one happy thing I can do as a moderator is uh, remind us what the two questions were and ask you to reflect on it. So, do you ask yourself, do my grade distributions reflect my students' learning? Is that one of the questions you ask yourself? Of course it is, right? And is it all about just me? Well, I think we have learned that there are many other influences besides just me, but mm -hmm. it is about the way we structure our course and that kind of fun stuff. So I would ask you to, uh, in your couple of remaining minutes, uh, ask your colleagues at your tables to see if there are any questions that you can help with or if there's any advice that you can give to us as panelists. So let, let's take a couple of minutes, but before we do that, can we give these people who got an A at the beginning a round? <laughs> <laughs>